Thank you, choir. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Carricker. Please turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 28. We'll read verses 18, 19, and 20, a passage familiar to many of you. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Clearly, the Great Commission of our Lord Jesus Christ is divided into three easily identifiable parts. Referring to the Greek text, we find the verb has to do with making disciples. That's what the Lord commanded, make disciples. But we also find three participles that describe the means by which disciples are to be made. One participle refers to going. Well, you got to go to get, amen? You got to go to get. Am I wrong? You have to go to get. Um, another is to baptizing. And the final participle refers to teaching all things whatsoever Christ has commanded. Thus, you see, our church's responsibility is shown to be going forth to evangelize the lost, to baptize those who are hopefully converted, and then to provide instruction to those who have been baptized with that process of instructing running the course of the Christian's entire life here on earth. If that is our church's responsibility, let me now point, point out to you a pastor's responsibility, which is partly described in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. You might make your way there. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, where the Apostle Paul wrote from Roman imprisonment to the congregation in Ephesus these words, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from which the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Okay, long passage. But as you can see in this passage, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers like moi, are charged with perfecting the saints, which is to say equipping believers. My task as a pastor is to perfect church members. It is to equip church members for the work of the ministry by church members. It's church members who do the work of the ministry, not the pastor. That is, I am tasked by the Lord Jesus Christ to teach you to train you, to counsel you, to prepare you, to cajole you, to get you who are church members to do the work of the ministry and to show you how to do it. For me to succeed at my calling, if you will notice in verse 14, church members need to progress beyond the spiritual stature of children. According to verse 15, members need to grow up unto Christ. This maturing process will become evident, verse 16, as members demonstrate unity and mutual interdependence in a loving manner that results in the congregation growing spiritually and numerically. The Christian who functions as a lone ranger, I'm all by myself, I'm not a church member, I just... I just do my thing. 
does not work with others as a member in a congregation to fulfill the Great Commission is at least spiritually infantile and may very likely not be a Christian at all. To bolster this, notice that Christians need to grow and mature spiritually. Turn this time to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll look at verses 1 through 4. A couple of more passages, but it will not be a complex sermon. 1 Corinthians 3, beginning with verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, the Apostle Paul clearly indicates being unspiritual, which is to say being carnal, is the same as being a spiritual babe, immature. Thus, there are Christians who are spiritually immature, with the immaturity manifesting itself, displaying itself, exhibiting itself by carnal believers related to disunity in the congregation. Among other indicators, they are, they are envious of others, they strive with others, and they are divisive, imagining their issues are more important than the unity of the body. But that is not all. Turn now to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. <clears throat> of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. And I, I can't write to you people because you don't listen. For when the... For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. There we have it again. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The problem addressed in this passage is related, if you'll notice in verse 11, to dullness of hearing. The late Greek scholar A.T. Robertson refers to this as being slow and sluggish in mind as well in the ears. So Christians who do not pay attention as they ought remain spiritually immature. The result, they are unskilled in using God's word and they cannot discern good from evil. They think something is wrong when it is right, and they think something is right when it is wrong. And they're Christians. They're just baby Christians. Now turn to 1 John chapter 2, verses 12, 13, and 14. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Though the aged Apostle John elsewhere in this epistle referred to all Christians as little children, owing to their youth and inexperience compared to him, he was about 90 years old when he wrote this. I'm persuaded that in these three verses, you will agree with me that he was being somewhat more specific. In these three verses, John grouped Christians into three levels of maturity. Little children, young men, and fathers. The little children's sins are forgiven. They know the Father. But not much more than that can be said of them. They're, they're Christians. We understand that this is how every Christian starts out. You begin your Christian life this way. The young men have matured to the degree that they are spiritually strong. The, the Word of God abides in them, and they are twice described as having overcome the wicked one, who I take to be the devil. Being labeled young men suggests 
that these Christians are capable of reproduction, though they have not yet re reproduced after their kind. They're capable of bringing people to the Lord, they just haven't done it yet. In other words, they have not yet succeeded in bearing fruit as Christians. So think back, who can you point to that you were instrumental in bringing to Christ? If not, you're, you're, you're probably no farther than this along. Fathers, the most mature category of Christians, have shown, have, have known him that is from the beginning as well. By virtue of their being labeled fathers, they apparently have, already have spiritual offspring, which is to say they have borne fruit as Christians who are instrumental in bringing others to Christ. If you can point to someone you have been instrumental in bringing to Christ, you are in this category of maturity. If not, you remain immature. I mean, it's on you. It's not other people deciding whether you are not. It just is what it is. Collecting our thoughts from these passages, we recognize that God's Word shows that believers come into the Christian life as spiritually immature babes in Christ, saved from their sins through faith in Christ, and justified in the sight of God, as justified as they will ever be, the new Christian still faces the challenges of growing and maturing. It is with this need to grow firmly fixed in your mind that I want you to turn now to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, when you find that place in your Bible, I invite you to stand and read along silently while I read aloud from, first, from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that obtained, obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, that is, by the promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound... They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. In other words, my job is to remind you again and again and again knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Won't you please be seated? The apostle was old at this point, and he knew he would not live much longer, verses 14 and 15. The Spirit of God moved him to write these things to refresh the memories of his readers before his martyrdom. I want you to focus your attention on verses 5, 6, and 7. Visualize the steps towards spiritual maturity that a Christian passes through from conversion, mentioned in verses 3 and 4, to the spiritual maturity, fruitfulness, unwavering assurance of salvation, and even promotion to glory in heaven that are referred to in verses 8 through 11. One thing to point out before we look at these various levels of this ministry ladder, I like to think of it as a ladder that you climb. Verse 5 begins, And beside this giving all diligence, add to your faith. Giving all diligence. Okay, so now the sinners come to Christ. 
He is born again. She is born again. Though he, she is a spiritual infant, that person may find himself, herself in an adult body with a mature intellect, may even be sophisticated. Everything in his experience tells him that he is mature. However, the Word of God clearly shows him to be a babe in Christ with respect to his spiritual life and development. So what must the babe in Christ do? He needs to add to his faith. He has faith in Christ. He is saved. He has come to Christ, possibly after some time striving to enter in. His sins are now forgiven, and he is a partaker of the divine nature. However, in order to grow spiritually, he must realize that spiritual growth does not come as easily as physical growth, since physical growth toward maturity occurs unintentionally, so long as there is shelter and sufficient intake of food and water. And of course, guys, you, you got to work on the guns. Boy, you're humorless today. There's nothing more ridiculous looking than a big guy with skinny arms. Okay, so help, help, help yourself here. Spiritual growth is not unintentional. Rather, it is intentional and does not occur apart from what Peter refers to as diligence. Fritz Reinecker, a Greek scholar, describes diligence in this way, to bring alongside of, used idiomatically with the word effort, to express the idea of bringing in every effort. We are to bring into this relationship alongside what God has done every ounce of determination we can muster. Close quote. Just an aside before we move on. Do you see what incredible damage has been done to the cause of Christ by what I refer to as decisionism? Some refer to it as easy believism. Not only do most people think salvation is to be gained with no spiritual conviction by the Spirit of God before conversion, but then after that, people are convinced that no effort is required to grow as a Christian after conversion. Wrong on two counts. I hope they're right on the third although evidence suggests mostly otherwise. Let me emphasize that salvation is by grace, through faith, apart from works of righteousness which we have done. However, there is a place for, for striving prior to conversion, according to the Savior Himself in Luke chapter 13, verse 24, and a place for diligent effort once in the Christian life, according to the Apostle Peter here in verse 5. I didn't write it. Now let us look to see what the child of God is to make every effort to add to his Christian life by God's grace. In other words, you're supposed to be all in on this. First, add to your faith virtue. What should be added to the saving faith by which means you entered the Christian life? What comes after you embrace the Savior and take Him as your own? Something called virtue. Oh, well, I know what that is. Ah, maybe you don't. The Greek word translated virtue is, is re related to moral energy. In, in classical times, the word meant the God-given power or ability to perform heroic deeds, whether military deeds or athletic or artistic accomplishments or the conducting of one's life. The basic meaning of the word indicated the quality by which one stands out as being excellent. Again, Reinecker. In other words, from the get-go, God's plan for your life as a Christian is for you to be a most excellent Christian. And anything short of a commitment to excellence will result in you falling short in your progress toward spiritual maturity and fruitfulness. Of course, fruitfulness is the real indication of salvation, not whether you go to church or not. Thus, you may not end up being the greatest Christian who ever lived, but you will be the greatest Christian you can possibly be. This speaks of an attitude toward personal holiness 
and an attitude towards sinning that is not often found these days. Just stop assuming that you, that you can sin at will and there will not be consequences. Stop the sinning and live a consecrated holy life. Whatever it takes to get it done, get it done. And that process includes pastoral guidance. Next, add to your virtue knowledge. What is referred to as knowledge? I suspect that it is both the knowledge of God and the knowledge of God's Word, since the two are actually inseparable, are they not? If you do not know God's Word very well, you do not know God very well, because it is in His Word that God reveals Himself to His creatures. It is also important to notice that knowledge comes after virtue. This is because of what the Savior said in John chapter 7 and verse 17. Listen carefully as I read. Jesus said, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. In other words, the key to knowledge is the commitment to obey. Likewise, a commitment to obey is connected to the moral excellence that accompanies this concept of, uh, uh, of virtue. <clears throat> Thus, you, you do not seek to discover God's will as, is re, as it is revealed in God's Word so that you may then decide whether or not. Let me see what it says so I can decide whether I want to do that. That's not the way it works. Rather, you first decide that you will obey God included in this thing called virtue, and then will come the knowledge by means of reading God's Word, studying God's Word, learning God's Word, as you said, under preaching and discipleship, and gaining the wisdom to properly apply God's Word in answer to prayer. Unless you become an eager reader of God's Word, an eager student of God's Word, an eager listener to the preaching and teaching of God's Word, and somebody who has already decided you are going to comply with God's wishes before you know what His will for your life is, before you even find out what it is, you've already decided, I'm going to do His will. And if you're not willing to do that, you're not going to grow much as a Christian and it may suggest that you're not a Christian at all. Third, and to knowledge, temperance. If you turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, you'll see that temperance is listed as one of the several aspects of what's called the fruit of the Spirit. Thus, we see that what the Spirit of God produces in the life and personality of a Christian over time is something that the Christian is to diligently then incorporate into his own life. What does this reveal? It shows us that the Spirit of God makes use of means, using a Christian's guided efforts to produce in his or her life what only the Holy Spirit can accomplish. <coughs> that understood, what is temperance? Temperance is self-control. The Greek word refers to literally holding yourself in. How can temperance be seen in a Christian's life? Well, that's easy. Let me give you one illustration, but a really good one. Control of your temper is a big one. The ability to exercise control over your emotions and your reactions to disappointment and discouragement. If you can, if you can keep a lid on it, then you have achieved some level of temperance. If you blow your stack, that doesn't describe you. You, you, you know what babies do when they get angry or when they are disappointed and, or, or discouraged about something or, or when they get really tired? Wah, wah, wah. Wah, 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 wah. They cry. As the physically immature cry, the spiritually immature vent their anger with what we call in the South conniption fits. Anybody ever heard that phrase before other than character? Yeah, conniption fits. Okay, that's blowing your stack. As one grows in spiritual maturity, however, several things happen. First, he realizes that temper tantrums are a very poor testimony. 
Second, he realizes that God's plan for his life is not to get everything he wants. It's good to learn that when you're really young. Good to be taught that by your parents. Okay. Good to teach your kids the meaning of the word no. And third, he realizes that fits of temper do a great deal of damage to everyone. Getting mad every time something happens you do not like is a tremendous impediment to spiritual growth. The Christian who is committed to growth is the Christian who gains self-control. After all, you cannot present to God as a living sacrifice a life that you have no control over. You gain control of your life so that you might present yourselves a living sacrifice to God. Fourth, and to temperance, patience. This word patience translates the Greek word hupomone. The word refers to the ability to hold out or to bear up in the face of difficulty. An example of this character trait would be, for some of you may not recognize the name, Richard Wormbrandt uh, was a Lutheran pastor in Romania during World War II and during the, the reign of communism. And, and um, uh, he... Uh, <laughs> He held out in a communist prison for 12 years um, for refusing to deny Christ. Uh, and, and he is exemplary, of, exemplary of, of the opposite of, I just couldn't take it anymore. Well, he took daily beatings. He took daily beatings for 12 years. So I don't want to hear anybody say, I just couldn't take it anymore. Uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that, and I have no sympathy. Uh, he's just a regular guy who got thrown in prison because he was a Christian, and he wouldn't renounce Christ, so they beat him every day for 12 years after telling him, you know that woman that you recently married, your wife? She's dead. We just want you to know she's dead. He didn't believe that. He didn't believe anything they told him. Why? Well, it was the government. How do you, why do you believe government? Fourth, continuing, it is, it is rightly seen, this thing called patience, it is rightly seen as related to the kind of mental toughness that good soldiers of Jesus Christ display when called upon. I think of Adonai Judson, who labored for so long in Burma with so few results in the early 1800s. I think of William Carey, a missionary to India, standing fast in India after his wife lost her mind and attempted to kill him with a knife. Those men did not waver. They stood fast for Christ's sake. And this is what I think the Apostle Paul was, was urging upon his readers in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, where he wrote, Therefore, my beloved, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Fifth, and to patience godliness. What is godliness but devotion toward God and a constant regard for His authority? John Wesley observed correctly, I think, that godliness is the proper support of patience. Otherwise, a man's patience may be the result of pride and stoicism, which has nothing to do with Christianity. How often do we see Christians who are truly godly? How often do we see Christians who display a constant regard for God's authority in their lives? How often do we see Christians who walk before Him in fear and, and piety? The answer is not very often. What surprised me many years ago when I first studied this passage as a young Christian was not the presence of godliness in a description of the character traits of those who are spiritually mature, but that such a thing as godliness typically surfaces so far along in the typical Christian's process of maturing. It's not something that's early onset in a Christian's life. Thus, we not only see so few godly Christians because so few who profess Christ are truly converted, but also because among those who are converted, there are so very few who are very mature. Regardless of age or experience, only a truly godly Christian is fairly mature. Sixth, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. The Greek word translated brotherly kindness is the word Philadelphia. That's where the city was named. Using that word, it refers to brotherly love, the city of brotherly love. 
or love for the brethren. And if we have learned anything this year is that our church needs to work in this area. Uh, am I right? We need work on this. Amen. In John chapter 13, verse 35, the Lord Jesus Christ said these words to his disciples and by extension and application to us. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. Incredible, is it not? How late into this process of maturing as a Christian comes the trait called godliness and then this characteristic of love for other Christians. That's kind of downstream from conversion, isn't it? Real love begins with this love rather than requiring those new to us to first prove themselves to us before we show our love to them. No, no, no. We show our love to them first. Why do you suppose it is that so few professing Christians are truly godly or are loving toward their brothers and sisters in Christ? Can, can it be anything other than so few professing Christians being truly saved and so little progress and maturity among those few who are truly saved? Not much progress at all, sad to say. And finally, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Turn to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. And note what Paul wrote to those members of the Thessalonian congregation. He wrote to them, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To those very immature, weeks old Christians in that baby church, Paul set before them the goal of abounding in love toward one another and toward everyone, not just Christians and church members, toward everyone. He concludes the verse, even as we do toward you. In other words, he wanted those new Christians to learn to love by imitating what he had done and how he had loved them. Remember how I loved you? That's what I want you to do with other people. To the Corinthians, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Right? What is revealed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, is a vital component in this process of maturing as a Christian, growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the conscious imitation of more mature Christians. You should consciously imitate more mature Christians. Thus, how you are to become a truly charitable Christian, which is to say a genuinely loving Christian toward all people, is to imitate that same trait in the lives of more mature Christians around you. The mature Christian withholds love from no one. Amen? Though no pastor is by any means infallible, a starting point for an immature believer, typically, not unusually, and this would be someone who might even be a judgmental, unloving, and even hot-tempered young Christian, the starting point is very frequently to mimic the pastor. That's who he knows best in the congregation. After all, the pastor is the one who is charged by God to show church members how to serve God. Okay. So Christian, let me ask you a question. Are you are are you you first a statement? You are supposed to grow and mature. That's God's plan. In order for you to mature and grow, you're to you're you're going to have to put forth what at times seem to be heroic efforts. It's going to be hard. But if that is what it takes, then that is what it takes. Since it must be done. It must be done. You must put into this growth process everything you have, knowing that only as God blesses your efforts will progress be made. But progress is necessary, or else you will not mature into a godly Christian. You will not mature into a Christian who loves Christians, and you will not mature into a Christian who loves all men. You will not become Christ-like. 
And God's whole process of sanctification is to conform us to the image of Christ. So let us end this notion that once a sinner is saved, he can sit around and wait for the second coming of Christ or death, whichever comes first. That's just nonsense. That's not in the Bible. That's, that's, that's fictional. Or, or that we have no holy obligation to lovingly embrace those who seem to be unqualified or somehow different from us. Imagine, picture this in your mind. Close your mind for just a moment. No, I don't trust you. I'm not going to hurt you from here at this time with your eyes closed. So close your eyes for just a moment. Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail. Imagine the Philippian congregation's reaction when after the earthquake, after he introduces him to the Savior, after he baptizes him, Paul and Silas then bring that Roman jailer to church for the first time. <gasps> you brought a Roman? <gasps> you, brought, you, you, you brought a soldier? <gasps> I don't think they reacted that way. I don't think they reacted that way. I think they were glad he was there. We close by turning to Philippians chapter 3, verses 12, 13, and 14, where we see Paul alluding to his own process of maturing as a Christian, thereby setting an example for us to follow. He writes, Not as though I had already attained. No, I'm not perfect, guys. I got issues. Either we're already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended for Christ Jesus. In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm making progress in my Christian life. That's, that's, that's what we're after, progress. Perfection this side of heaven is not going to happen. But progress, yeah, you're not much of a Christian. Yeah, but you should have seen me before. I may not be much now, but I'm different than I used to be. Verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If Paul, think about this, if Paul needed to diligently apply himself to progress in his Christian life, surely we see the need for the same in our own lives, if Paul needed to press, then I need to press. If Paul needed to press, then you need to press. Now, the great news for each of us, we may not be much at present, but God has a plan for each of us to grow as we go in the Christian life and as members of this congregation. That's something that we, we should rejoice in. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We recognize that so many Christians, and sadly, oftentimes me, do not represent you well. But we are works in progress, those of us who know Christ. We've come to know the Savior, and the growth process begins. And sometimes it's slow going. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes there's heartache. Sometimes there's disappointment. Sometimes, frequently, there are setbacks and there are failures. But over the course of the Christian life, there will be growth, there will be development, there will be the acquisition of virtues, there will be maturity. We thank you for this promise and this encouragement, and you, uh, we pray that you might help us to recognize that the component that we supply by the grace of God is diligence, that we must, we must press to help us to do that which is right and proper and good in your sight, and we will, for that reason, thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.